live. <laughs> so this is always the tricky thing with technology is it says we're setting up the webinar on Facebook. And then at the same time on this other screen, it says that we're live right now. So <laughs> good times. Um, that's what I was, I was like, just smile and just know we might be being listened to right now already. <laughs> So, hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jolene Brighton, and today I am joined by a special guest, Siobhan, who is a SIBO survivor, patient advocate, and TV personality, and we're going to be diving into all things SIBO. So you're going to get the down low on what is SIBO, how to prevent it, best treatments, and really cutting edge treatments that are you know just now making their way into clinical practice. So welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Oh my gosh. It's such an honor to be here. Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us and me. I'm Siobhan Sarna. And in case you don't know what SIBO is, because I didn't know until 2015, it's not IBS misspelled, but I thought it was. Yeah, it's totally right. right? <laughs> it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then when I found out what it really was, I hated it even more because I hate the name. However, it is what I've had probably since I was, I don't know, five, and I got mine, where'd you get yours, um, from probably food poisoning that over time, every time I got food poisoning, it got worse. And mm -hmm. then you, have you ever had this happen, doctor, where you're sitting at a dinner table and the person across from you is totally fine. You get food poisoning, but you ate the same thing. Yep, totally. It happens to my patients all the time where there's certain things that make us a lot more susceptible. And so the idea that, oh, if you all ate the same, same meal and you're the only one that got food poisoning, it couldn't have been that meal. It's completely false. I think that's a very archaic process because as we understand, like, different things affect our motility, like having SIBO ever. Ever, exactly. Or food poisoning ever. So yeah. I'm just sharing that with you. So if you think like, oh, I don't have that. Well, that's what I really thought for a really long time. Like I didn't even know what SIBO was, as I mentioned, but it comes from a lot of different things and it could be from adhesions. It could be from thyroid impellence. It could be from endometriosis. It could also be so something called post-infectious IBS, meaning that you were infected with this food poisoning the inner, inner lining of your intestines has this confusion now with the antibodies that you produce and it slows down your motility. Thus, for whatever those reasons are, your underlying cause, bacteria that would normally live in the large intestine and could be totally cool and not you know, like negative pathogenic bacteria ends up in the small intestine, which is fairly sterile by comparison to the large intestine where the big microbiome lives. And it becomes like this little still and it brews and, and it makes gas and think of a brewery, a micro pub. <laughs> and um, that's why bloating is one of the biggest things that happens when you have SIBO. So if you have ever felt bloated, I know most of my friends have, it could be because you ate a lot of salt or whatever, but it also could be SIBO if it's consistent. And if you have uh, diarrhea or constipation or alternating diarrhea or constipation or like IBS, that's just like, you don't know how it got there. You don't know what to do about it. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. But bloating is a prominent part of your existence. Totally. And this is, some, I really appreciate you framing it in that way because I think that, um, and so if you've ever had SIBO, you really hate those bugs. Like you hate them. I, I developed SIBO as a result of food poisoning. And I actually didn't have any symptoms. And it wasn't until like my husband, I was like, I know you got SIBO. I know that's what's going on here. And doing the testing, he was like, I'll do it if you do it. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it, but I'm fine. And when I did the testing, my gases were like 300 parts per million. So, and we're going to talk more about testing. And I, and then it was after the testing that I remember I ate like a bag of cherries and, um, <laughs> and that set me off. And, had, and this is something that um, bloating, you know, for people who've never had significant bloating, they're often like, oh, that's uncomfortable. You have to undo your belt a little bit. But that was the first time that I had experienced that degree of bloating. And I was in the bed, like writhing in pain. My husband was so freaked out. He was like, I think we need to go to the emergency room. And I, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm like, I don't need to go to the emergency room. I like need to burp or fart or something here. Like, and, but it's not just that because it's also the inflammation that's taking place. So um, I really want to say though, I like that you frame, like these are good bacteria. And that's the thing I really try to educate patients about is that 
they're good bacteria in your large intestine, but when they get into your small intestine, that's the totally different story. And it's not that the bugs are necessarily bad. It's where they're living and really what is going on. So, you know, you were saying some of the root causes of SIBO. So maybe you had, uh, you had food poisoning, like we've talked about. You were also talking to endometriosis. Can you talk a little bit about how that can actually lead to SIBO? Anytime the tissue around your intestines is shimmied or jimmied or in a different location, you have a cesarean maybe, endometriosis, um, like I said, adhesions, which is like that interior scar tissue that happens. I had it from a seatbelt that pulled my stomach and connected it to the lower uh, left part of my, or upper part of my left side of my colon. Oh my gosh, that's pretty extreme there. <clears throat> oh my gosh. You could literally have been hit with a baseball as a kid or even as an adult. Your body goes, yikes, and it binds on the inside to hold everything together. And those little adhesion collagen fibers are like, you know, I don't know, I think it's 30 times stronger than steel. So it can really move your organs around. And then there's the ileocecal valve, which is that little flappy valve between the large intestine and the small intestine. And if it's not um, staying in place properly, the juices or the bacteria can sort of backwash down into the into the small or up into the small intestine. So there's all kinds of reasons, including thyroid imbalance, because that directly affects motility. You were talking about estrogen dominance. There's just so many things. Now here's, this is huge. This is gonna be something that you probably are already preaching to the choir, but you have to get tested for SIBO if you think you have it, and here's why. And I'm not a doctor, I'm a patient, just like you are, you were a patient too, <laughs> you're a doctor. Um, it also has some of the symptoms that, that can be disguising ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a huge advocate of testing. So when you test, you know. Yeah. Either and that is, I really love you saying that because that is so important because SIBO is really, it's hot right now, right? Because we just figured it out and a lot of people have it. Like, and a lot of people have digestive issues, but it's always understanding what's the root cause. Like what, if you want to make it gone for good, you better figure out how you got it in the first place. But you're so right. Like changes in bowels, constipation, these kinds of things. And you may very well have SIBO, but you may also have ovarian cancer. Like there is no reason why you can't have both things going on. Now we've got a, they, and I wanted to say hi to Becky and Michelle and Christy. We've got some people jumping on here and already asking questions. And one is Christy was asking, you know, can she begin treating SIBO if she has it, or do I need to wait for other tests to come back? And you really just answered that question with like, you need to get the full picture of what's going on. But when it comes to testing, how can people understand if they do have SIBO and if this is their issue? So super great question. And by the way, the whole like ovarian cancer thing is not to scare anybody. And it's just, I've just heard of a couple of cases like that. So of course it sticks in my brain. It's, it's not common, but you know, like let's all be. Super yeah. Sure. I mean, ovarian cancer is not common, but in the United States, by the time it's detected, it's usually, it's very life threatening at that point. So I think it is worth mentioning that. And it, it really, it is an extreme example in some respects, but it just shows that like, don't, don't guess. You got to test, you got to understand what's happening. So that Christy, I'm so glad you asked that question. So there are a couple of things. First, I'm going to talk about what you can do until you take the test which is a breath test, B-R-E-A-T. It sounded like it just a breast test. That's <laughs> I know, so when we're talking to women, they're yeah. like, test them a breast. <laughs> yeah, uh, breath test. Um, you can actually check out uh, the SIBO specific food guide. There's some very special um, diets that you can do. And when I say diet, it's really you know, food choices versus like counting calories to check to make sure you're eating foods that don't ferment easily. So that's what the whole low FODMAP is about. If you are following any of the IBS literature, or the way people eat with IBS, and then it's even more specific when it comes to SIBO, but you can start there. That's a great place to start um, to control your symptoms. So diet doesn't cure SIBO. Although Dr. Norm Robillard of Fast Track Digestion has experience with that. I'm going to talk to him very soon about that. But in the meanwhile, because I'm not a advocate pro on that yet. I can't wait to be though. Um, in the meanwhile, you can control your symptoms with diet by eating lower fermentable foods, as well as maybe you're going to have some charcoal every now and then if you're having a flare like you did after the cherry incident. Uh, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't test. Okay. Because once you get that breath test done, which is drinking lactulose 
which is a sugar that doesn't get digested in your body. It feeds the little bugs. And then those little bugs exude uh, either hydrogen gas, gas, like literally hydrogen gas, methane gas, think of cows, right? And then um, it could also be hydrogen sulfide, which is like a sub component of SIBO. And it measures the parts per million after a certain amount of time that the lactulose has had a chance to travel through uh, your small intestines. So it's not that expensive if you know about the right places to take the test. I actually had one of mine done at Cedars Sinai with Dr. Mark Pimentel, who's one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, researcher on SIBO in the world. And Etna, God bless you, Etna, came back and said that it was experimental. That the, that the test was experimental, which is ridiculous, sorry. Uh, but if you go to aerodiagnostics labs, it's just one of the labs that I'm familiar with, they will work with you. So if your insurance isn't paying for it, I've heard of people spending as little as $145 on it. So I can't say that that's their policy. I'm just saying that's what I've heard of. They're very committed to helping. So you can do the test at home. The first time I had it done, my insurance did cover it just depends. And you blow into these tubes as a baseline, then every 20 minutes, there are little test tubes in a bag and it collects your air. Then you ship it off to the lab and they measure how much hydrogen, how much methane that you have parts per million in those. And that's a reflection of how much, how many bugs you have producing those gases that are call, causing the symptoms. It's an overgrowth of that bacteria in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. and we, we use aerodiagnostics in my clinic. And what I'll also say is if you are wanting to pursue testing, you need to work with a doctor who understands how to code for that. So there are ICD tens with their diagnosis codes and I've worked, I've done, I've treated so much SIBO and played this game so many times that I'm like, okay, I know the codes that you're going to get insurance to listen. And then we just have a reflexive letter, like already drafted, ready to go. That if the insurance says this is experimental, that I'm like, here's the letter of why it justifies this person's condition. And like we plug and play with their codes and then here's some studies. And um, it's something that like you can get covered by your insurance. It just depends on the coding. But at the same time, you know, the sad truth of how insurance works is that you're, it's oftentimes, you know, less risky and cheaper to just pay out of pocket and then get reimbursement from the insurance because the markup difference, I mean, the test might cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars if you pay out of pocket, but if it goes to your insurance first, it can kick you back to like $2,000. Like, and because they already build your insurance that they have to then collect that from you. And that's like, that's really tough because, you know, especially like if your insurance isn't going to cover like if you decide to go the pharmaceutical treatment route, like these things start to get expensive and you, whenever I'm ordering tests, I'm like, we also need money left over for the treatment. If this, if this comes out um, positive as well. And so, you know, just to, you know, let people know this test that she's talking about, the lactose breath test, it needs to be measuring at least two gases, methane and hydrogen over a three hour period of time. And why that's important is because I've had people come into me. They're like, my doctor said I didn't have SIBO. I look at the test. It's a 90 minute, 120 minute test. And they only measure hydrogen. And I'm like, well, we're missing so much data here. Like, yeah. and the doctor didn't talk to them about what their transit time was like in the first place or when they took the test, which is also something that's very telling as well. So you were, you were talking about get tested first. We had a question come in. Lindsay is talking about how she has SIBO, fungal, mold overgrowth all together. So I'm assuming she's probably talking about she having um, fungal overgrowth. And we know there's a phenomenon called CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. We don't have a great way to test for that. I'm going to venture to guess. I know you have a online event coming up when you, where you're interviewing experts. Are you going to be covering like the candida issues that, cause they go hand in hand with SIBO for sure. Oh my gosh, totally. So Donna Gates is one of our speakers in this online event. I know that, that, uh, to know Donna is to love Donna. I call her the fairy godmother of natural healing. I haven't told her that that's what's in the copy, so I really hope she's cool with it. But anyway, um, she's going to talk about candida. She's one of the world's leading experts on candida. We also have Dr. Satish Rao, and he is out of, um, gosh, it's a, it's a university in Georgia. I'm sorry, Dr. Rao, I can't remember the name of it right now. But he is one of the world's leading experts on fungal overgrowth. So I had two amazing conversations with them about that. And um, he talks about some very advanced test techniques that are quite invasive. Um, and Donna talks about, you know, 
some other aspects of it. So we do cover it and it's super, super important and very frustrating. And I know that because I've had it too. So it's just, it just sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and there's some people that are talking about like they've had stool culture on here and nutri eval testing, organic acids. And I think that that's one way we can start to piece it all together because, and you guys definitely, if you are interested in going deeper on this and hearing from these experts in the arena, definitely we've included, I saw my team just put a link in there for your online event about this um, because it's really, I mean, it's more than, I mean, you need an entire hour just to talk about um, fungal overgrowth in the intestines. Yeah for sure. So, you know, there's questions coming in um, about treatment. One person's like, are you familiar with Megaspore probiotic? I love Megaspore. So Misty, yeah. thanks for that question. She's saying she has success reversing SIBO, using it along with healing her gut, using bone broth, gluten, dairy-free diet. So it sounds like she was doing several of the interventions you kind of mentioned. But when it comes to SIBO treatment, like if you could get to this, uh, just an overview for women who are listening right now, like kind of what's, what's on the platter for them? <laughs> well, there are three major ways to treat SIBO. So symptom treatment is diet. Uh, and it can be really, really effective to be, just make you feel better. But in terms of killing the bugs, which some people are like, that's a little harsh, but that's what ultimately you're doing. You're killing them in that location right? So it's the elemental diet, which is a liquid diet that was originally designed for the astronauts and has also been used in feeding tubes. It nourishes you when done properly, but it starves those bugs in that location. So that is actually has the highest success rate. It's also really hard to do. Although if you're really suffering from SIBO, a lot of people I know that have done it have said to me, oh, I wish I had done that first because it would have just been I would have gotten on with my life so much more quickly. You know, so that is seriously the real talk right there though, is that <clears throat> whenever, you know, I diagnose someone, it's, it's up to me and it's really ladies, it's up to your doctor to give you all your options and let you make the choice. Nobody ever chooses elemental diet first, nobody. But I will say, um, you know, I reserve it from those like hardest to treat cases, but they say the exact same thing after rifaximin, after like, you know, all these other things that we're going to talk about, you know, after going through that and then they do the elemental and they're like, why didn't I just start there? And I'm like, really, for you to be successful with the elemental, you kind of need to struggle a little bit so that you stick with it. But I mean, this, the, the research has been great on elemental and the outcomes are fantastic as well. Yeah. And the, you know, it's great for your guts because it rests them for that time. So, you know, people use it a lot for um, IBD, irritable, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but so that's, that's the elemental. And then there is rifaximin, which brand name is Zyfaxin. And that is a drug that's out there that treats IB, officially treats IBSC, So ir irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And Michelle, I just want to note, Michelle, yeah, pay attention here because you were just asking, she was asking about Zafaximin, Zafaximin, Rifaximin, you know, the similar same, same drug. Um, and, you know, she's asking like, that seemed like the best fast track way, but can SIBO come back? So Michelle, I want you to, to listen to this piece. So let's get through the rest of the treatment and then let's talk about relapse recurrence. Okay. I think it's IBS with constipation. I'm sorry. I can't remember because I have both. So sorry. I, that one blanked on me, but I don't say you're not a doctor. It's not your job. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad I can pronounce it. So <laughs> it's called Rifaximin, brand name Zyfaxin. And by the way, they do have some good coupons at, um, it's Salix, which is the manufacturer. So that's a drug that just before you hear the word antibiotic and like freak out, like I did the first time is it has been studied to stay in the small intestine. So I know that, you know, we're all trying to take less pharmaceuticals and less like we need to have our lives saved, um, but we're all really careful about our microbiome. It has been shown in studies to, to not, you know, blast and nuclear war on your microbiome. And it is quite, according to studies, safe. So something, a decision you'd have to make, of course. With yeah, your and it's like to frame it, it's not a broad spectrum antibiotic yes, because that's what so many people, they hear antibiotic, they think it kills everything and anything. And so you know, with this pharmaceutical, it's been engineered to you know, try not to leave the small intestine. I mean, that's what the research is saying. We know though that people are individual. So, you know, as much as 
studies and clinical, yeah. you know, trials and all of that can say, I just always like to frame that, like, you know, you should also always ask the question of what's true for you, but this is not broad spectrum in the capacity where it wants to kill everything. And I love that it's not a nuclear bomb to your gut. <laughs> yeah, right. It could be an explosion, but it's not a nuclear bomb. Here's, here's what you also should probably know. It's for traveler's diarrhea. So it must be for IBSD. Anyway, so like sometimes if you're going to a country that you might be concerned about getting traveler's diarrhea, they will sometimes give rifaximin to you as a preventive measure or as a, like a prophylactic. So just to give you a reference about like, where did this drug come from kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And just to say, so Michelle, if you're, you're concerned about relapse, that is one thing that doctors do is that if you're going to travel or you're going to be susceptible to picking up something, it's, I mean, it's not just food poisoning. You can pick up parasites more. You're more susceptible if you have SIBO with that. This is one thing that your doctor can do to help with the return of SIBO. Big time, really. I have um, also just some advice I picked up from Dr. Pimentel uh, about at Thanksgiving and anytime you're at a buffet or a, a you know potluck, always eat the food that's hot and eat from the middle of the pot because all that other stuff is is more susceptible to um, food poisoning ultimately. But the other treatments are so we have the elemental diet, we have the zyfaxin rifaximin. And then if you have methane producing bugs, there's another neomycin that you can add to the rifaximin that has shown to be very effective, quite effective to treat the methane dominant SIBO. And then there's herbals, which is really exciting for those of us who love natural. I've done it all. I've done all three treatments. Uh, and those have been studied to actually be slightly more effective in the study than the antibiotics, pharmaceutical ones. However, those will take you a month and the pharma will take you two weeks, but keep in mind, and this was a huge thing for me, doctor, is that I thought that like, you know, I don't know, some flu or virus, I would take these pills and I would be better when the, you know, script on the bottle said, oh, take, you know, two, 14, okay. All right, uh, well, when that's done, I'll be better. No, what these do is they lower- It's so sad face, but it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. I was like, miracle, right? Like, you know, like, Instant, gratis, instant gratification, why am I even waiting 14 days? You know, because we're just so programmed that way. But it reduces the gas levels. So what, when you see the gas levels do, going down after you have retested, which the doctors that I um, have learned the most from really do suggest that you retest right after your treatment so they can see, was it SIBO exactly? Or do you still have it? And, and are we on the right track? So it will drop the gas levels. Sometimes people have to take rifaximin five times, but they've done studies to show how is it, is it losing power? Are you becoming resistant to it? And the studies show that there you you can do several rounds without totally you know getting devastated with your microbiome. Yeah. And it is something where the relapse of SIBO, I see that, you know, it's, it can be really high. And what I explain to patients is because, you know, when I, when I see relapse, it can happen. Let's just say like, we ain't judging anybody because stuff happens, but uh, there is a piece of it where your doctor is treating you for SIBO, but they don't totally understand how all of it works. And if you understand what is really at the crux of SIBO and how it works, you can prevent relapse. So let's talk a little bit about that because I know there's several people and ladies, I really appreciate. I know Christy's asking about motility agents. Michelle's Ooh. loving this advice. Um, hey, and Steph Stephanie's talking about, can you do several rounds of um, herbal treatment as well? So ladies, I appreciate these questions. I also wanna say that like, if this information is helpful for you and you think more people need to hear this, let's be sure to share this and get this out to our community so that we can support more women in being able to heal their body. So let's go into the relapse because that ties into Christy's questions about you know motility agents as well. Right on, great question. So. Relapse is so high, it's ridiculous. Okay, so this also, I didn't know when I first started getting treated. I thought, once again, I'll take this pill. I'll take it for two weeks. I'll be well. This will never happen to me again. Wrong. So this is where I became very familiar with the concept of managing a chronic condition because my um, post-infectious IBS is not cured by those drugs you can reduce the bacterial load in the small intestine, but you have to get to your underlying cause. And right now there's really no cure for, for example, post-infectious IBS. However, with the way that I have it, 
for so long in my life and so many multiple times. However, you need to be doing no matter what, right after you, you know, treated SIBO, a prokinetic. So what's a prokinetic? It's exactly what you're saying, Christy. It is a motility agent. Think motility, like motion, right? You're moving your guts, you're moving the material through your guts. There's something called the MMC, which is the migrating motor complex. And that is this uh, like crumb cleaner of the inside of the small intestine. And it's just like getting those little micro particles of bacteria so that when the micro migrating motor complex does its job, it sweeps out that bacteria in a normal body function so that you don't have SIBO. But if that's all jacked up, you're going to probably have SIBO. So the motility agents, the prokinetics helps with the synchronization of that motility and the nerves of that, of that area of the body. And that helps to prevent relapse. Now, if you have a physical structural ileocecal valve or adhesions, you're destined to probably, probably have relapses, but the motility agents can at least keep things sort of the table cleared and can help with management for sure. Absolutely. And that's something where um, I know you're going to be speaking um, on your online event with experts who are going to be talking about what do you do about those adhesions? Because there are therapies that you can do for adhesions. They'll be talking about the different prokinetics and who they apply to and which ones to choose because, you know, there's several natural ones out there. There's also pharmaceutical options. And it really just comes down to like, what does your body need and what's true for you? I do want to shout out Misty. She shared this. Um, is talk right now with her scleroderma and functional medicine group. So thank you so much for that, Misty. I really um, appreciate that. And then um, Marcella's coming on. I'm curious with your online event that you're running, it's all about SIBO and IBS. And by the way, ladies, that link is there below that you can check that out if you're interested. Um, is there anyone talking about pregnancy, SIBO and pregnancy using antimicrobials during that time? Thinking. Okay. So you know what? I didn't talk about pregnancy as much as I talked about infertility and it was mm -hmm. with Dr. Stephanie Hayes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to say not as much as I probably should have about pregnancy. So I'll let you talk to your personal doctor about that. But if anybody is looking to get pregnant, you should definitely try to clear your SIBO and you should listen to Dr. Stephanie Hayes, who's a naturopath out of Portland, who like by accident observed that when her patients cleared SIBO, they, their infertility issues cleared up. It was fascinating. Absolutely. Because SIBO they, is inhibiting your ability to absorb nutrients. It's a signal to your environment that it's not safe. So you're not going to ovulate. You're going to have fertility issues. But the thing I see in my practice is that if you don't take care of your gut first and you get pregnant, what happens in the first trimester? I actually see that pregnancy can be a triggering event for developing SIBO because in the first trimester, progesterone goes high, motility goes down because progesterone keeps the baby around. It's a very good thing, but it slows gut motility, which means the reflux of the large intestinal bugs can make it into the small intestine. And in addition to that, we're starting to get immune system shifts, which means that we're more susceptible to food poisoning. Why a pregnant woman can eat the same meal as someone else and she gets food poisoning and they don't. And why we freak out in medicine if you eat anything raw and pasteurized is because you are more susceptible to those things. But SIBO, I have seen time and again, gets worse during pregnancy. And you definitely have to work with your provider. Only your medical provider can advise you on the treatment of that. But what I will say is that, you know, with um, pregnancy, it's often when if a woman, so just for a couple of ladies listening who've been asking this, we use motility agents like ginger. You're going to use that for nausea anyways. That's safe in pregnancy for you to be utilizing, leveraging a low FODMAP diet, not, not restricting food greatly, but understanding which foods are triggers for you and pulling those out. Because like you said, that gives symptom relief. And then when it comes to antimicrobials, nada. Now, garlic is one thing that some providers will use, but um, something like berberine, which is an uh, herbal antimicrobial, we don't do that in pregnancy. And so, you know, your doctor, as they should, is going to take the most conservative approach as possible, which may mean that you have gas, bloating, and you feel awful during your pregnancy. And I'm very sorry for that. But some of these things are called teratogens. Well, they're known teratogens, which means they're, they are fatal to babies. So you, you got to talk with your doc about that to know how to address it appropriately. But I just wanted to speak to that. And if you are a woman who is struggling with fertility, like Siobhan was saying, 
check out her online event where she's bringing you all of this information so that you can understand better. And you know, what's interesting about you saying that, and I definitely want to encourage you guys go check out Dr. Hayes's talk as part of this event is that I've seen women who their first pregnancy, they develop SIBO, like their symptoms, everything is like, okay, you develop SIBO because you're pregnant plus a small human pressing on your guts, as we were talking before, inhibiting motility, and then they can't get pregnant again. And that infertility is really rooted in what's happening with their gut. So I think that's a super um, important topic, but I think, I mean, <clears throat> best thing you can do is like treat the SIBO first. Your microbiome becomes baby's microbiome. If you have have SIBO in pregnancy, that's, that's not going to be to the detriment of your baby. Like you have SIBO in pregnancy, you have a lot of good gut bugs in the wrong place. It's not like having yeast overgrowth in pregnancy or a parasite in pregnancy. It's, it's not like that. Um, so in terms of, so we've talked a bit about tre treatment. We've talked about um, preventing relapse. Um, what have we not covered that you're going to be going into as part of your IBS and SIBO SOS event? So, and I love that it's the IBS and SIBO SOS. I think that's such a great name for, for what's going on. But what else can women find um, in that event? What else will they learn and what kind of information are they going to have access to? Well, this is actually the third event that I've done like this because I've been obsessed with, well, healing anybody who would listen to me about SIBO because it haunted me for so many decades. So, um, and, but it's all new material. And Dr. Allison Seebecker is also a world's leading SIBO researcher and she's a SIBO patient herself. And she helped me with this summit as well as the other two events that I did. So definitely check out her talk about IBS and SIBO, what's the difference? What's the relationship? Because the number one underlying cause of IBS is SIBO. And she talks mm -hmm. about different treatments for IBS because you can have IBS and not have SIBO. It's just not the majority. So she's amazing, you guys. Dr. Allison Seebecker is amazing, loving. You'll just love listening to her and she's got a great spirit. But Dr. Leonard Weinstock, listen, you have to listen to this man. Okay, listen, you have to listen to this man. He is now obsessed. He's a gastroenterologist from the Midwest, and he is obsessed with mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS. So what that is, and I didn't know what this was until I interviewed him about a year ago, and he totally changed my life from this one conversation. It's, I'm not a doctor, so I'm just going to call it what I think it is, which is like this massive inflammation histamine release disaster going on in your body that can lead to so many detrimental things long-term. Uh, you just need to learn about it, okay? If you don't feel well, if you don't feel well, or you know someone in your life who doesn't feel well, who has chronic inflammation, it is worth checking out. Also a condition called Ehlers-Danlos, which is a collagen disorder. Can you do this, doctor? Can you take your thumb? No, I cannot. But if you, hey, ladies, if you could take your thumb, no, it's usually in men, but if you could take your thumb and press it there against your wrist, like that's a connective tissue disorder. And that can be big trouble into the gastrointestinal tract. I do want to speak to like, um, I would encourage anybody watching right now to go watch that talk on histamine for the reason that sure it could be what's going on with your gut, but we are now understanding that histamine and period problems are besties. And so this is something to understand that histamine, estrogen, what's going in your gut on, on in your gut, they're all related and they're all connected in that way. So, um, and I will say, share too, that I don't think, uh, I'm trying to think if there's, I went through your whole speaker list, but like all of your speakers, they were either an instructor, they're a friend of mine, they're a colleague of mine, they're someone I've seen speak before. And that, you really have like the titans of the SIBO world in this event. I was very happy with the lineup. I was very proud and privileged and honored that they wanted to participate in the event because these guys, a lot of them, like if you're online already and doing like health research, you're going to see Dr. Tom O'Brien, who's amazing and brilliant and is the one who convinced me to stop eating gluten. But you're also going to see people who do not have an online presence, guys. They are so deep in clinical work and in research that they're like, they don't even have Facebook pages. Okay. So <laughs> they're, so you're well, it's like Allison Seebecker is yeah. like genius. And you go to your website, her website and you're like, yeah, she, this is not where she's investing her time. Like she's investing her time, like in the research and doing all of those things. I fortunately have a team so I can do both. <laughs> right. Right. Which is awesome. <laughs> She actually does invest time into that website. It just looks like the 1990s. That's all. So, which she will agree with first thing. But, uh, but 
yeah so that but like she hasn't been on facebook in like you know five yeah. years no her so. investment is all in the research so you can go yeah. to her research section and that's where it's all at you won't find pretty pictures of her and like all that other stuff that you find yeah. that i'm like that's on my website um, all of that but like the research is a great place where i send patients and like check out her website because that is it like she is continually updating that research on that um she's got one section that is continually updated yeah, absolutely. So, so the lineup is stellar. Uh, you'll have people talk about mindset, uh, SIBO patients that have like, you know, gone through it all from abuse to adhesions to everything in between. Um, a lot of the, per, the practitioners and presenters are SIBO patients too. Mm -hmm. So that's really always interesting. Uh, it's just, it's, it's everything that I wanted someone to know about if they think that they have SIBO or IBS or they're just bloated and they aren't really sure because I have, you know, I had IBS for so long and some, a doctor with best intentions told me to take an antidepressant. Well, mm -hmm. it isn't all in my head. And if he had explained that he was actually trying to help my serotonin level in my gut, I would have not been so insulted, even though there's nothing wrong with helping with one's brain, but I was uneducated. Mm -hmm. confused and he wasn't the greatest communicator might have been great but he wasn't telling me that day what it was what, what was happening so I really have tried to cover all of the gaps in knowledge uh, for a beginner for a practitioner for someone who's already super educated I was very happy with a lot of the stuff that like I know people haven't heard about mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're just figuring this stuff out like right now as yeah. well as some incredible, great foundational uh, practices that we should all seriously consider. Well, that's what I think is awesome about your event is that there is stuff that I know I'm attending medical conferences where these speakers are talking to us. And so I'm taking what they're learning in the research. I'm pulling that in. I'm using it in my clinical practice, but nobody's out there talking about it on a grand level. It's really, it's, it's, uh, you know, clinician to clinician, not clinician to patient, unless you're having that one-on-one. -on -one. So I really want to encourage you guys, you know, click that link that we have for you below, go check it out, see if it's right for you, because this is really an opportunity for you to hear from leading experts delivering this information to you. This is the stuff that doctors only usually say to doctors and that you need to make a doctor's appointment to get the one-on-one, -on -one, where Siobhan has really curated, brought it all together, and is taking the medicine and delivering it straight to you, putting it in your hands, which is something that I'm passionate about. So... Is there anything else that, you know, you want people to know if they are struggling with SIBO, if they feel like I've got, you know, I'm never, ever going to get a handle on this. Like I am just destined to struggle. Um, you know, anything that you can share. And I, oh, I just want to mention, Hey, Amy, um, we earlier on, um, she was wanting to know about herbals. We, we uh, you can go back and listen to this earlier on. We talked about herbals, but also in this online event, all of the different treatments for SIBO are going to be broken down so that you can really understand like what works best for you. So definitely, Amy, if you're asking this question, it's a good question. Click that link for the IBS and SIBO SOS so that you can get that information and really understand that. So sorry, Siobhan, what would you tell people who are like, this is it. This is my life and I have to suffer forever? Oh, please, please know this, that I'd never thought about this concept before until, you know, the past couple of years. And Dr. C. Becker and I've had these long discussions about it. You can feel 100% better than you do right now by managing a chronic condition. Because mm -hmm. I had this chronic condition for decades and I never managed it. So I felt terrible a lot of the time. Now that I'm managing it, working on a cure, but managing it, I feel 100% better. So don't hold me to the 100%, but you get the idea philosophically. You can feel a lot better by managing it. And by the way, SIBO patients typically have anxiety and there's science behind that. And it's a lot of freaking work. Mm -hmm. Dudes, no lie, it's work. So I understand what it's like to go, I just have to take a break. I have to rest. I'm not gonna think about it. I'm, you know, I'm just gonna rest and I'm just gonna like, whew, take it down because it's easy to get burned out. I got pill fatigue. I mean, and of course, never get off your medications without talking to your provider first. But just, you know, it's that inch by inch. It's a cinch. You just got to educate yourself. By the way, it's 44 different presentations. It is Ooh. over 
Yeah, it's a, it's a ton. <laughs> September 3rd, which is Labor Day in the state. So you have the day off, I hope. And so you have some extra time there. And then it's for September 3rd through the 10th. So it's a lot of information. Okay. So just grab what you can, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to learn it all right away. It's just a couple of little tidbits here and there could really move you forward on your path. It's free for those days. You watch that one day it's available for 24 hours and it goes away. Um, if you want to pick it up buy it, great. It's like the, the event's like only $59 right now. I think it goes up after Tuesday. If you don't, you don't ever have to buy it. Okay. I just want to be really clear about that. Just go learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, the other thing I, I would encourage you ladies to do to not have overwhelm is that all of the talks are listed there and you can see what applies to you most. Um, I love consuming this information and I think it's, uh, it's such an amazing time that we live in that we can have access to so much information. So I really want to say, I appreciate so much that, I mean, I know how much work it takes to interview 44 people. I mean, that's like at minimum 44 hours out of your life. Life, but the, we know there's front end, back end, and all kinds of stuff that goes into that. So, you know, it's clear to me that this is a passion project for you. This is something that you are really passionate about educating and advocating for patient care. And so I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak to my audience, for putting this event together so that people can get access to the information they so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. It's an honor to spend time with you. I really am humbled and very appreciative that you would take the time to listen and to learn. And as I always say, don't give up. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Take care. Thanks, Doc. Bye, Bye. guys.